Build Show today, we've got a building science lesson for you. You know, as a builder for the last 25 years, I have loved taking apart old houses because I always learn some lessons that I can apply to my new builds or my remodels. Now, my company is just starting this brand new remodel on this house. This was built in the 1990s, so it's about a little over two decades old. And we're doing a bunch of work inside and out, including replacing the stone with the stucco facade. And we've started de-skinning. Now on the build show today, we're joined with my buddy Steve Basic. You all know Steve. What's up, buddy? Now we started on the garage to even worked our way around. What are you seeing already on this uh, on this house? <laughs> yeah, so I mean, initially I gotta agree with you. There's nothing better than taking apart a building, whether it's 20 years old or 100 years old. You know, it's kind of like building science archaeology here. Mm -hmm. there's, there's a lot of stories to be told and a lot of lessons to be learned. I, you know, I jokingly tell people, I got my master's and PhD just remodeling buildings. No because doubt. Because if you, you, if you slow learn. down and pay a little bit of attention, there's a, there's a lot of lessons to be learned. Yeah, and, and look at this, guys, where that rock stops, and you can see the garage has been taken off here. There was sheathing on the house. That's what that o half inch, 716 OSB is. But there was no weather barrier. There was no house wrap. There was no zip sheathing. There was nothing to protect that barren OSB. And normally you would expect that to be a giant disaster. But what are you seeing here, Steve? Well, first of all, I mean, if you look up high, what do we got? We got roof gutters. We got good overhangs. Yep. We got a good overhang, overhang on, even on the rakes here. Yep. So initially, you know, we're taking a large portion of that water load that comes down from the heavens and, and we're taking it off the house. Yep. And so only a small portion is actually being seen by the wall. Mm -hmm. And, you know, there, there's a saving grace that, yeah, it doesn't have the building paper. When we go inside, we'll, we'll see how much insulation. My guess is there's probably none in the wall that a lot of the success of this building is because it was so poorly built yeah. that it, it survives very easy. And it had the, a good uh, umbrella over the building, right? And it had a really good umbrella. Yeah. You know, when you, when you look at a wall like this, it's pretty easy to see. You know, up here, that OSB looks almost brand new. Yeah, looks like the day it was installed. As you come down the wall, you can see this is wafering a little bit here and there. And then as you get down here, you can see uh -huh. where it's grayed out. Yep. So it gives you a quick understanding of probably never saw water, yep. saw a little bit of water, saw a lot of water. Yep, that's right. right? So you get an understanding of, okay, well, how, how do I flash the building? How should, when I put the building back together, how should I be putting it back together? But there, there's lessons to be learned when you pay attention. Agreed. Let's walk around this side, Steve, and see what else we can see. Now, the first thing that's interesting to note here is we've got all the solid sheathing here, but in the gable, you can see they switched to a foam board sheathing. And then as we come around the wall here, we got the same thing. There's some foam board sheathing. What's going on with that, Steve? Yeah, so, you know, there's this concept of we put the shear panels in the corner yep. to handle the shear of the building, and then we infill, and we use rigid insulation on the infill there that, you know, is, if we're going to put sheathing, that's non-structural, but yep. it gives us a little bit of our value to, to help us out. Now, one of the really interesting things about this kind of area is that they chose to flash the horizontal joints, but they didn't flash the verticals. Yeah, it is interesting, isn't it? You know, I spoke to you earlier about, you know, about 20 years ago, we did a full scale mock-up of a house where we sheathed it with shear panels and XPS, and we only treated the horizontal joints. And mm -hmm. then we did a, a very large water testing scenario on the house, and it actually proved to be pretty darn successful. Interesting. You know, water water will get in here, but it's going to find this edge, and it's going to come down, and then it's going to get kicked out here. Yep. Because that know, flashing is behind. Because that up, flashing right? runs back. You can see it runs up. It runs up a good four or six inches. Uh -huh. I mean, four inches is probably the norm. Yeah. For a flashing lift, and that certainly exceeds it. So. You know what else is interesting about this too, Steve? Is this is a really common detail in the South. We see this all over in Texas. This is a paper-based flashing that's been coated with plastic. This house is a little over 20 years old. Look at the shape that it's in. I mean, it's it's absolutely worthless at this point. Yeah. And it's totally degraded anywhere that saw any water whatsoever. So this is kind of a worthless detail on a house because it's it's a paper-based flashing. Yeah. And you can see down here, there's evidence where this got wetter 
than the rest of the wall. Yep. Again, it's down by that brick lug down there. And not a lot of care for uh, flashing details, obviously. You can see some melted <laughs> XPS, some duct tape that was put on by somebody at some point. Yeah. Not doing a whole lot of good, but yet the crazy part is not a lot of rotten damage. Well, you know, it, it, th this is, this is a great example where, yeah, it's a really expensive house. Mm -hmm. And, you know, we're, we're going to do the right thing when we put it back together. But understand that the bones of this house conceptually are like a lean-to. Yeah. There, yeah. There's no insulation. There's a little bit of sheathing, a little yep. bit of shedding of water. Yeah. But any water that gets behind the system just simply dries out. Yeah. So it's a huge energy pig, but that's the saving grace of this yeah, house. Yeah, that's right. You know, I wouldn't advocate this if I was building this house today. Yep. We but, wouldn't do the same system today. But but there's hard evidence here that that was a saving grace. Yeah, and as we come around the corner here too, Steve, you're seeing the same thing. I mean, in this in this big wall section here in the back side of the garage, look, they've got one shear panel here that's OSB, two foot overhang, a gutter beyond that, and this part here, I mean, it's in great shape. There's really there's no there's no rot here. It is flaking a little bit, so I think over time this is disintegrating. Yeah. It's not as strong as the day it was installed, but it's still, I mean, it's not rotted. Let's well, put it that way. Well, and you have the increased benefit of that brick lug just dropped down yeah. another six or eight inches That's right, there. that brick lug's way down here. So this flashing now is not disintegrated like the other flashing yeah, was. Yeah, it, it hasn't been sitting in water for the last 20 years. You know, the other thing that I'm not seeing at all is sprinkler heads pointing towards the building, too. you got to be really cautious about that. If sprinklers were hitting this, this would be a way different scenario. This yeah. would be all rot, wouldn't it? And yeah, mold. No, exactly. And and the site here, you know, it plays a, a little bit of role too in that we always talk about down and out. Yep. That here you can see we're we're literally walking downhill. So the water that did come down here is moving away from the house. Yeah. Look at the rot on the uh, on the door here. Yeah, that was, you know. That's been sucking up water for years yeah, and they years. Did, they didn't use an Endura jam saver, <laughs> frame saver here, no, did they? That's been all. soaking up water and it's it's just dying. Not at all. It's and pretty it's, bad. It, you know, when we were walking around here earlier, I, I found it pretty interesting. Up there, you know, there's no wind. You come down here and all of a sudden we're starting to get a wind come mm -hmm. up off the hill. And yep. you notice that the durability and the story of the OSB changes a little here. Yeah, that's right. So th this corner here is seeing a slightly different pressure difference than the rest of the walls yep. because you got that wind that's coming up the hill and it's pushing that water in and we're getting a lot more degradation here than yeah, we are seeing, in other sections of the... You're seeing this, this is kind of flaking. It's definitely seeing some moisture load on here. It's losing its structural integrity for sure. It's not rotted per se, but don't forget that stone on the outside. That's what they call a reservoir cladding which means that stone was soaking up the moisture. Here you go, this is a, oh, there you go. That's this is a, a pretty great. nice shot, right? You yeah. get to see what it was and you can see how tight, tightly woven the OSB was there and you can see how the moisture here has is flaked it. flaked it out. Yep. You know, and it's, you know, so kind of a sacrificial layer. It's, it's, it's about due for yep. some help. Yeah, it's due for some help for sure. Now, if we can zoom out a little bit and see what this corner back here looks like. This is a three-story section of the house. Anytime we get to a three-story section, we've automatically got more exposure because that two, two foot overhang on a one-story section is gonna help, right? We've got an umbrella that's down low on our body. What if I raise my umbrella up many feet above my head? All of a sudden, the wind's gonna hit it more, which means that stone absorbed more moisture. We're seeing more damage in the corner, for instance, on the OSB and actually got up on the scaffold to hit that master bedroom window, which has kind of popped out. It's a bath window near a bathtub. And I found a couple interesting things out there. So let me actually lace in my Instagram footage from the other day when I was on the scaffold up there. John's pulling off this flashing for me. I'm curious if this uh, L-shaped flashing here created a dam that held some water and the OSB is real bad right there. So we're gonna Pull that piece off and see what we see. Keep going, Sean. See if you can get that next piece off. Can that will that rip off? All right. So up here, OSB looks real good. These overhangs and gutters did us some real nice benefit. Now this window got a little uh, nasty underneath the window. There we go. Oh yeah. What do we have here? Oh man, gross. 
Goodness gracious. Well, that's into our framing. Yeah. Look at this too. Look at that moldy. That piece of, uh, that piece of uh, insulation facing is right there. Oh, that's great. Oh, ants. We got ants on me. <laughs> Ah, ah. Thanks, Sean. All right, I'm good. I just absolutely sprayed Sean with some ants, but look at that. Oh my gosh, they're streaming out of there. Where there's water, you'll find ants. Those look like fire ants too, Sean. Don't, don't let them get you, brother. Get those things off of you. Gross. Look at that. That's disgusting in there. So the water from that overhang... That gutter was helping certainly the lower rock, but not here. It was hitting that window, splashing down, hitting the face, no waterproofing. And then this angle right here was catching the water and sending it right back in the house. Not as much rot as there could be, but certainly disgusting and thoroughly avoidable with the correct waterproofing strategy. That is really gross. We're going to find some action when we pull the bathtub yeah right on the inside of this yeah there's going to be some nastiness in there no doubt so so here you can see matt and you, you made a really good point the minute you start getting exceeding that two stories and getting to three stories our exposure becomes much higher as well as you know here's a leading corner yeah. that's facing the lake and you got that wind coming up off the lake but one of the interesting stories to be told here is we have a series of windows. Notice that the windows, they're impermeable to water. So they can't store water taken on. They're a shedding and collecting device, right? They collect that rainwater, they shed it, and then it gets concentrated in the corners. And you can see there, very limited flashing, poorly done, but you can see the degradation of the OSB in that area, just because for the last 20 years, water got pushed up to the jam of the window and then got redirected to fall to gravity there and basically just saturated that whole area. So, you know, the other thing that's interesting here, Steve, is these windows are replacement windows. These are a vinyl window. They've cut the nailing flange off. You know, they probably replaced these 10 years, five years ago. They just cut them out of the brick and popped them in and cocked them. But what's interesting, there's actually not as much damage as I might have thought there had been underneath those windows. There's no real sill pan underneath those. They were just cocked in place, but yet there was plenty of airflow. So the, the OSB is certainly degraded, but it's not as rot as, as kind of what I expected. That's pretty interesting to see. Yeah, and I, I think it just it goes back to my little lean-to concept is that th this house is air open. Yeah, for right. Sure. So whatever hits it, basically it has the ability to dry. And remember, when we're talking about wetting, drying, things get wet, but they just need to dry more. Yeah. And whoever owned this house has been spending an exponential amount of money on baking the cooling. house dry. Yeah, I bet, I bet their bills are over a thousand bucks a month on yeah. heating and cooling this house. Steve, there's some interesting stuff in this basement area down here. Let's go in the front door and see what we can see on the inside of the house. I'll meet you in there. All right, Steve, the outside of the house is pretty interesting, but we got a couple things down here that I think are worth talking about. So now we're in the basement level. We're partially underground at the front of the house, walk out here, you know, traditional kind of hillside lot. And down here, Steve, check out what's happening behind the baseboard. Starting there at the stairs, you can kind of pan your way around and see when we pulled the baseboard off, because we were going to do some remodeling down here, everywhere, not everywhere, a good majority of places behind the base, we found this kind of blackish mold growing back here. It's not necessarily though, I would have thought that you might see that on outside walls, right? Because the vapor drive. Right. But we're seeing it on interior walls as well. What do you think's happening with that, Steve? Yeah, so I, I've seen this before and most of the time it's most likely due to the bottom plate is sitting directly on top of the slab down mm -hmm. here. And it, it's basically coupled to the slab, slab is coupled to the ground. Yep. So even though it's 72 or 70 degrees up here, the ground temperature, slab temperature, and bottom of wall temperature, virtually the same. Yep. And you get a moisture load in here through capillary action, get some moisture behind that uh, baseboard, and we have the right temperature, we have a food source in the gypsum board, and we have a moisture source yep. 
in some condensation there. And the paper and facing is kind of growing a little bit then. Yeah. And it's not happening up here though because it's able to dry up here. Well, it's able to dry up here, but also the, the surface cold. temperature here is probably you know Closer five or 10 degrees warmer right. than down here, yeah. right? When we look around and you look at where we're getting our air from, yep. you know, up it's above. Yeah. So the warmest temperature is up here. The thermostat's at, you know, four or five feet. Yeah. That's the coldest part of the room. Yeah, that's pretty interesting, isn't it? Now on an air sealing note, Steve, these are replacement windows. You can kind of see you've got side screws here. These were screwed into the side. This was the original uh, expanding foam the builder put in when the house was built. So when we, these windows went in, that expanding foam's not continuous anymore. Now there's not as much of it as what I thought, but you can see a little bit of some mold kind of growth happening on this window jam on both the jams and the head. What do you think's happening with that, Steve? Yeah, again, I think it just goes back to the fact that, you know, the, the house is just this big energy pig. And the mm -hmm. saving grace is that air was able to move through it. Yep. And the air, the air stream coupled with, you know, expensive energy dollars mm -hmm. saved this house. I mean, there is some small evidence there's one of these windows has some mold up here. Yep. So you're starting to get some evidence of mold growth and such, but you know, again, not advocating these practices, but yeah. the, the reason this, this house has survived is just because how poorly it was built. That's interesting. Well, what are the takeaways? You know, this, this house, 20 some years old, they probably didn't realize there was some mold growth back here. And unless they had a compromise or a really, um, uh, you know, someone who is particularly sensitive, there's plenty of mold growth outside in the air as well. So this isn't necessarily some terrible, uh, you know, indoor air quality house. But the interesting takeaway for me is that the house actually survived pretty well because that wood was able to soak and dry and soak and dry. And there's not as much rot. Now, I certainly wouldn't advocate this, and the bills were probably ridiculous. Right. Any other takeaways you can think of? Well, the big danger is, is, what do you do from here, right? Because if you just come in and just start kind of haphazardly saying, well, I'm gonna insulate the walls, I'm gonna insulate the attic, the, the roof, turn it into a hot roof, spray foam in there, then you severely start changing the dynamic, right? right. This house is very successful because the airstream just literally flows through these walls because the roof isn't sealed up. Yep. The stack effect is just draining this basement of air and it's being replaced through the wall system. Now, if I go up there in the attic and I say I spray a hot roof and fill the roof up with isonine, then I minimize the stack effect, which minimizes the draw across the wall, which minimizes my drawing, drying potential. So this is a house that it's, it's painful to look at, but its success again is because it's that lean-to. We start changing it from the lean-to to something more energy efficient, something with a little bit more you know, building science oriented, you really have to make some appropriate decisions that make sense for this particular house because yeah. you don't, you don't want to change that dynamic unless you're changing it in a way that you thoroughly understand what changes you're making. Yeah. You know, and, and to that point, we're going to resheed the whole house. We're going to rewaterproof the whole house. We're changing all these windows out so we can put sill pans in and do them correctly so that when we put this house back together, we won't have those moisture problems. Yeah, and you know, the homeowner certainly has the benefit of, of having you and your company behind this because you know what decisions to make, mm -hmm. you know? But what I, what I can say is, look for me on the Build Show Network because we're gonna spend the next couple years talking about how do we make appropriate decisions? That's and right. what's the right decision for the right situation? How do we build a long lasting, durable, energy efficient house that's not gonna have these kinds of problems? That's not gonna have these kinds of problems. And that you don't have to come in and do a million dollar renovation in 20 years, <laughs> right. which is crazy. It is. Guys, look for Steve Basic on buildshownetwork.com. He's got a bunch of videos up already. He's posting once a week to that location. If you're not already a subscriber, there's a newsletter button. I'll put a link in the description below. So every Friday morning, you get an email from me saying, here's what's new in the network, including Steve's video. Hit that subscribe button below. We've got new content every Tuesday and every Friday here in the Build Show. Follow us on Twitter and Instagram. Otherwise, we'll see you next time on the Build Show. 
All right, let's lower that build show music because we got something really important to look at here. So one of the things I wanted to point out, keep in mind 20 year old building, overdriven fasteners in OSB. I mean, those are driven to a point where I can't even see the nail heads in most of them. But the one thing to notice is there's no degradation around these, right? I know on Instagram, I get emails, I get messages all the time asking about overdriven nails. Should we tape all the nail heads on OSB? And here's evidence of a 20 year old house that certainly had water get behind the stone facing and we have no evidence of degradation at the uh, overdriven nail heads. So you can draw your own conclusions, but I just wanted to point that out.